Yeah, thanks for the welcome, you guys. This is uh, my special girl, Andrea, over here is going to be helping me with visual aids tonight. So, yeah, she's, uh, she's been a big part of getting me ready to get out here tonight, share a little vulnerability with you that this is the first time I've ever told a big crowd like this my story. So bear, bear with me if I get a little nervous on you. Yeah. It's, uh, first of all, it feels awesome to be back in my home state of Colorado. I grew up in Crested Butte, just over the hill, so being back here feels awesome. And uh, being back here with all of you thoughtful humans is, is really special. I've really enjoyed hearing you guys speak the last couple of days, and I think this is an awesome event. I really appreciate the invite from uh, 9,600 folks. And, Amy, I appreciate the challenge for uh, having me come up here and, and tell my story. Um, I, I got to admit, it, it was a bit of a process for me to kind of put something together for all of you. It, it forced me to uh, do some reflection that I didn't necessarily see coming. I, I didn't want to get up here and pretend that, you know, I'm an expert on anything, really, um, especially this wheelchair. I'm, I'm still very much trying to figure out all of everything that this chair adds to my life. Um, yeah, I have, a, I have a picture here of my uh, nephew pushing me this summer in Portland. Um, it's the first time I ever let anyone really push me in my chair in uh, nine years of being injured. Um, he's just an adorable little kid, and he wanted to push me up the street, so I let him. And uh, I think the fact that that was you know, the first time I actually let someone help me in that capacity says a lot about how I've kind of dealt with this injury, and I think uh, there's been positive aspects and, and negative aspects, but I really am excited to just share my story with you guys and how that kind of intersects technology and how that changed my career um, at some pretty pivotal moments. And yeah, I hope you guys enjoy. So it might surprise you, but I'm not here to speak about disability. However, as I said, it's obviously part of my story. I'm not going to put by any of you. Um, but while we're on the topic, I do want to tell you my favorite thing about being in a wheelchair, which is people are genuinely curious about me. I see their curiosity. I see your curiosity. And I try and build a bridge there. And it's a really powerful tool for me um, to just be human with people. Uh, they can see I wear a vulnerability, um, and people are just really human with me, and I, I really appreciate that. Um, you know, I do want to leave you with a little notion outside of disability, technology, storytelling. Um, it's not so much to do with disability. It's that each and every one of you have a privilege a privilege that brought you here to this camp. And with that privilege, I want you to create opportunities for others. This is a really important part of my story, so I'm going to say it again. Each and every one of you has a responsibility to create opportunities for others. Does that resonate with you? Has anyone ever had a door held open for them along the way? Would any of us really be here? without that opportunity having been afforded to us at some point. So we're in a position of privilege in creating opportunities for others and inviting them into this world. And that's really what I'm excited to talk to you guys about tonight. But I am going to take you through my history in the ski industry as a vehicle to kind of get there. So I've been lucky enough to live a life full of great privilege. And it took becoming a quadriplegic for me to really understand how much of that privilege I was taking for granted. I'm passionate about creating opportunities for others now because my personal story in my career as a filmmaker, a storyteller, a marketer, it's all the result of opportunities others created for me along the way. Starting with my parents introducing me to skiing. I was instantly hooked. An instant ski bum. My mom often tells me the story of waking one freezing Vermont morning to find her four-year-old son nowhere in the house. 
I had put on my ski gear, made my way out to the family Subaru, and was sitting there awaiting my ride to the slopes. <laughs> Dedicated. Frequenting Haystack, the little ski hill down the road, was our family ritual. My father was a ski instructor, and my mom ran the race department. I wouldn't call Haystack a mountain, but it was definitely appropriately named. I loved it, hanging out at the race shack, the blue and red gates, the fast gear like my hot pink poles and my neon orange <laughs> Oakley goggles. At a very young age, I set my sights on racing for the US ski team. Also around this time, I had a run in with a VHS tape that was a window into a world I never knew existed. The Blizzard of Oz. I don't know that I'd ever seen a more fascinating piece of media put in front of me in my life. No offense, Jim Henson. My dad was a technology earlier adopter. And back in the late 80s, tech was making a big consumer push with the personal VHS recorder. I fondly look back at my curiosity with that recorder and the few VHS tapes that my family owned. I wasn't sure exactly how, but I knew that ski film and that camera had some sort of connection, and my curiosity was beyond sparked. I set my North Star purpose in life on being a skier at age five. My mom had been privileged enough to grow up here in Colorado and had gone to a school in, in Gunnison at a little school she affectionately refers to as Wasted State College. <laughs> school definitely known more for its proximity to the epic skiing and bars of Crested Butte than its academia. And Crested Butte was an 1800s coal mining town, quickly becoming known for its developing ski resort and hippie movement awakening the Sleepy Mountains. Many years later, she told me that in 1990, before I started third grade, that I'd already outgrown Vermont. She knew the love I had for skiing was calling the whole family back to Colorado. My mom felt eternally grateful for her upbringing in the Rocky Mountains and wanted to create that same opportunity for her sons to grow up in the outdoor playgrounds of Crested Butte. Lucky kid, huh? So we went, the opportunity and privilege to live in the Rocky Mountains. Trust me, even at age seven, I knew leaving the East Coast ice behind for the promised powder of the Rockies I skied my butt off every winter after that. Ski racing was my focus, but this Colorado playground had terrain I'd never dreamed of that was beginning to open my eyes and distract me from my, ski, my goals with ski racing. The mountain must have been 10 times the size of Haystack. It was some of the steepest terrain in North America, and snow was literally accumulating in meters, not inches. I lived in a ski town now, and I knew it. In the early 90s, Crested Butte was a bit of an epicenter for the fresh-faced sport of extreme skiing and the home, home of the newly crowned World Extreme Ski Champions. I was well aware at this point what was going on in skiing. There was a new breed of skiers on the mountain. Their colorful personalities and nearly all outshone even the infamous Alberto Tamba in my eyes. Of course, living in a ski town had many perks, as I'm sure many of you are familiar with. My favorite one was school ski day. No one I tell about this can believe that my school did this, and I hope they still do. Privileged community indeed. The entire school would duck out half day on Wednesday to go to the resort. We would split up into groups by skill level and volunteer parents would help shepherd us around the mountain until the lift stopped spinning. In middle school, the best skiers would get the honor of joining the Junior Ski Patrol. Our ski day was hosted by a great group of ski patrollers that I think genuinely enjoyed showing us young kids the ropes. The end of the day, outer boundary sweeps, lessons on bombs, avalanche control, and an introduction to the steeps of Crested Butte was a pivotal experience. One day we had the privilege of skiing with Dave Swanwick and Allison Gannett. They were fresh off their World Extreme Ski Championship wins in Alaska. These are the two people that first held the door open 
to the ski industry for me. I only really remember skiing one run with him, and to my complete surprise that night, I had a message on my home phone from Allison. My skiing had impressed them both, and they wanted me to join a development free skiing team that their main sponsor, Dina Star, was putting together. Being offered free gear from a company like Dina Star at that time in the ski industry for a 14 year old kid was unheard of. For free skiing, especially unheard of. Free skiing was a new movement that brought the raddest elements of all disciplines of skiing together. The speed of racing, the tricks from freestyle, and the exploration of extreme skiing. It was a world I'd been idolizing through my VHS deck for years now. I'm gonna grab a sip of water real quick if you don't mind. Do you have one? How many of you guys have seen this before? Oh yeah. Couple? Good. Free skiing was a new movement that brought about the rad raddest elements of all disciplines of skiing together. In 1997, the first ski magazine dedicated completely to free skiing, Freeze, showed up in my mailbox with the Crested Butte local on the cover. A young punk, rock punk rocker with bright pink hair and a huge white Cadillac was instantly elevated to my idol. Seth embodied everything fresh in skiing at that time. The bold style and the fact that he went faster and bigger than anyone else. His annual segment in the local ski, company, ski movie was a highly anticipated moment for the entire ski industry. This is Seth. He is insane. Um, very unique individual on the mountain and off the mountain. Thanks, dear. So every year, the best sponsors in the world, along with their fancy girlfriends, are, and sorry, the best skiers in the world, along with their sponsors and fancy girlfriends, were descending on my small little town of Crested Butte to look at where the sport had progressed over the last year. I knew exactly where I was and what I was involved in. I had my finger on the pulse. I knew a local TV station owner that was housing a local ski production company called Matchstick Productions. And at the time, there was a lot going on at Matchstick. They'd become a staple to the ski bum diet, feeding the masses stoke and anticipation for the upcoming ski season each fall. How many of you have ever been to a Matchstick movie? Nice. Nice. So you know exactly what I'm talking about then. You know, attending annual matchstick premieres quickly became a highlight for most major ski towns across the country. Skiers were flocking to pay homage to their favorite skiers and see the stories that they had developed the year before. The film would have two nightly showings and I'd be sure to go to both. I would show up hours early and help in any way I could and I'm sure I was just annoying the shit out of them. But it worked. I managed to befriend, befriend the owners of Matchstick, Steve Winter and Murray Weiss, as well as Seth Morrison, Shane McConkey, and the entire crew. The Matchstick office was the hub of cool in my little bubble. I broke down their door and announced my internship. I wouldn't say the door was quite held open for me, but it wasn't locked. Little did I know my growing dedication to Matchstick was about to dramatically change my life. Summer of 1997 was my first introduction to paralysis and my first introduction to ski industry tragedy. While helicopter skiing in Chile, the Matchstick team had a terrible accident. I remember exactly where I was that August morning. There'd been a helicopter crash deep in the mountains that killed the pilot and photographer T.R. Youngstrom and left Seth badly banged up. The accident also left Steve Winter with a badly broken back, a temporarily wheelchair-bound paraplegic. This is about the time my internship really picked up some responsibility. Murray and Steve had decided that regardless of Steve's injury, they were going to not close shop, but rather relaunch his MSP films. It was an all-hands-on-deck effort to put the film out that fall, 
and to move into a new office that was accessible enough for Steve to make his return from a rehab hospital in Seattle. When Steve finally did return home, he was in a wheelchair and in need of some extra help. And whether he liked it or not, I was his new intern and I was there to help. Packaging DVDs and trips to the post office was where my free labor was really bringing them some value. But what I was in it for was a sneak peek at all the footage. It was a major privilege to sit there on Steve's couch and see that film come together. To be able to watch the award-winning filmmaker from over his shoulder. To be one of the first to see these moments that had been skillfully captured on 16 millimeter film, often with the only other witness, the cinematographer. Moments that when carefully placed together over the right tunes would transport the audience to a place of divine inspiration. My lifelong fascination with skiing had put me on the front line, the cutting edge, in the MSP green room. It had also opened the door to an entirely new way to be a part of it all, film production. My senior year of high school, an opportunity was put in front of me that I couldn't pass up. I was told if I bought my own 16 millimeter film camera, I could essentially buy my way into a job. I had evolved my internship into an apprenticeship. I was also on track to graduate from high school early. I'd taken classes, cor correspondence classes, and used my internship with Matchstick to build up enough credits to skip out on my last semester of my senior year. Trust me, the teachers and principals were not on board with this. That fall, I tweaked my knee playing soccer, and I knew that my dream to ski in front of the camera was a dream that was not going to come true for me. Luckily, the opportunity for me to learn about cinematography and filmmaking was showing me another path, another way to be out on the mountain doing the things that I loved. I'd shown an interest in going to film school at Brooks in beautiful Santa Barbara, and also had a family friend that was going there at the same time who I was lucky enough to get some advice from. He told me that the entire graduating class of Brooks would be looking for a job as cool as what I had just been offered. So it was a no-brainer. I took the job, and rather than pursuing school, I took a $10,000 inheritance that I was privileged enough to be left from my grandparents, and I bought a 16 millimeter camera, a MacBook Pro, and a first generation iPod, and immediately became an instant cinematographer. <laughs> Luckily, with some of the greatest mentors the action sports industry had to offer. The first time I'd roll film through my camera was to capture this nutball, <laughs> Jay Quinlan jumping a snowmobile over a 100-foot dam spillway. And he did land way down here and rode directly into a creek after. <laughs> but it was a pretty special moment. I spent the entire winter traveling to capture these types of moments on film. And I spent the entire month of April that year heli skiing in Alaska. Now you see why I consider myself privileged. This is also when the entire, my entire view on these VHS ski videos really shifted. I now knew about film workflow, music licensing, what it actually took to make these images. I knew that privilege came with great responsibility. Responsibility to these athletes and sponsors to bring back images that shown a positive light on both. The next seven years would be a wild ride for myself and our crew. I can click forward one more. This is Jay Quinlan in, uh, up at Good Times in Breckenridge doing the first backflip on a snowmobile, which is now a pretty common thing to see in the X Games. But this was Quite a journey, led by one insane individual. So chasing clips while hanging out of helicopters, traversing the country 
for snowmobile access backcountry and with resorts willing to build us anything we could dream up along the way. It was an all-in effort to document the amazing progression of free skiing. And it felt like something new was happening every day. Progress was everywhere. So it was our job to chase down the best terrain and conditions for our athletes to perform in and to capture those, cl films, those clips for our annual film release. As a team, we were becoming experts in doing this, and it was hugely gratifying. Between the film crew and the athletes, we won multiple awards for our efforts over those years. Our work in filmmaking was pushing us to tell more stories and inevitably add more context. This was a challenge with the workflow of 16 millimeter film. I mean, I was already carrying a 70 pound backpack with no ability to capture audio. We had two to three minutes of capture time for each 100 foot roll of film. And after that, you had to quickly duck under your jacket, jacket and reload without exposing the film to light or disrupting the flow of the shoot. Then it was waiting sometimes months to get back to Crested Butte to see the films that we had actually captured. If your camera wasn't working properly or you were blowing it out there, that was when you found out. There was no instant footage review, no LCD screen on the camera. We really had to be experts of the craft and confident that we were killing it. First generation digital cameras were available at this time, but as cinematographers, we were thumbing our nose. We were snobs for the look and quality of film. However, that progression of technology was challenging us to bring digital cameras into our workflow and challenging us to become better storytellers, to add more context to our little world for our audiences. Around that time, truly high definition cameras hit the market and some of the first HD tele television networks launched. So we had to evolve. At, at MSP, we had the privilege of landing a seven part TV series with a network out of New York called Rush HD. And this really gave MSP the opportunity to grow. We grew our budget, we grew our athlete roster, our commitments to our team. It was a privilege that created an opportunity for all of us. I have such fond memories of those years. Eight months traveling the world, chasing the best conditions that we could find with the top athletes in the sport, and the rest back in beautiful Crested Butte, Colorado, mountain biking and editing. It wasn't my dream job. It's probably some of your dream jobs. Oppor opportunities, however, can cause conflict when they start to land on top of each other. At this point in my career, I had some very close relationships with some of the sport's most sought after athletes. And some of these athletes were attempting to stray from the traditional model of ski filmmaking. Some athletes were even beginning to produce their own film projects and their sponsors were being supportive of those efforts. This was becoming the norm thanks to the accessibility of digital cameras and the tossing of the notion that film was the only way to produce a valuable project product. Now kids were salivating over every little digital clip they could find online. Any chance to see or hear that behind the scenes perspective was obviously more gratifying than waiting until the next year to see a clip with no real context. Media had become digital. I was approached about working as a cinematographer on some upcoming Red Bull work and suddenly found myself making the hardest decision of my life. Would I leave my post at the industry leading MSP films, the team, the adventures, the history, the only job I'd really ever loved? As far as most were concerned, the raddest job in the fucking world. <laughs> I ultimately decided that it was my time to create some opportunity for myself and I resigned from MSP so that I could pursue working with Red Bull. Around the same time, another huge opportunity came knocking for me. One of the friends I'd made over the previous few years was given the opportunity to choose his own team manager at one of the biggest companies to, sh to ever show interest in skiing. 
Nike. Now that I worked with Nike for close to 10 years, I can tell you the day I received a phone call from them asking if I wanted the position was a major moment of privilege in my life. It made it my mission to create opportunities for others. I took my position and leveraged it to put more guys on the team. I put more girls on the team. I made sure that they all could work with the photographers and filmers that made them the most comfortable. I made sure Nike was leveraging them appropriately and that they always had a voice in the conversation. I planned extravagant trips to backcountry lodges for the athletes, and we rolled around Europe in full-on rock star tour buses. Nike never blinked an eye. The only drawback to the new job was Nike was that I'd also recently committed to a multiple year film with Red Bull, Transitions. It was initially a bit, I was initially a bit concerned about the conflict, but my boss at Nike was super cool about it. So cool, in fact, that he put Simon on the team and gave us some money for the film project. The next two years were a whirlwind. Documenting one of the sport's top athletes in real time while building the backstory for a documentary about his young, successful career in half-pipe skiing. The seriously non-stop travel, the endless contests, the work, party, repeat lifestyle. I don't know how those guys do it. The highs of witnessing Simon set a world record and the lows of watching him fall short of his goals. I'd planned to call the film Transitions as a nod towards Simon's career as a half-pipe skier. Little did I know I'd soon be going through the greatest transition in my own life. In January 2009, shortly after my last trip to Breckenridge here for the Dew Tour, Simon and I had traveled back to our old stomping grounds of Vermont. There was a Dew Tour event being held just down the road from my old hill haystack at Mount Snow. I'd asked my dad to travel from Bellingham, Washington to come meet us in his old, old hometown. And Simon's family was also traveling from his hometown of Bethel, Maine to come see Simon ski, which was a rare event for his dad. It was a family affair. Simon won. We partied. We roughhoused by the pool. And ultimately, I ended that evening, that victorious day, with a dislocated neck. This unfortunate news sent shockwaves through the ski community. The moment I dislocated my neck, I knew what lay ahead of me. Strangely, I'd been preparing for some sort of test like this my entire life. And it made accepting my injury at that moment a possibility. After I came out of sedation, I immediately wanted the X Games on TV. To my surprise, my friends would all be wearing bright orange Riley Poor stickers on their helmets in support. Seeing that made me want to come back stronger than anything for my supporters. And the only way I could see to do that was by charging ahead with what I knew how to do. Just make, make a movie, not become a tragedy. When I look back at that time, and that I'd come up with this name, Transitions, for our film, it's unfortunate that I couldn't really capture the true depths of the story in the ways that Simon and my stories had intersected in that time frame. The next four months I spent at Craig Hospital in Denver rehabbing with a C56 neck dislocation, which obviously left me in a wheelchair. Reinventing myself physically while still very much trying to cling on to my old realities. I met a quadriplegic man there that told me, I better stop focusing on the 900 things that I can no longer do and focus on the 100 things that I can do great. My outlet became work. I was hell-bent on finishing this project, whether it meant producing from bed with an interpreter 
reading my lips while I was tricked, or inviting new way, inventing new ways to stay connected with the minimal use of my hands. I worked my ass off in that hospital. Leaving the hospital, I flew directly to LA to Red Bull, where I managed to finish the film on schedule. I said that like it was easy, but it was definitely not. I had to be fully supported with my daily functions of life the whole way through, something I never could have done alone. I also had to teach myself how to physically edit and work with computers all over again. At first, I barely had enough strength to hold my hands up onto the desk. I was getting my first independent um, opportunity to direct a film, and for whatever reason, I needed to take it all upon myself. I accepted as much help as I could that summer, but ultimately ended up in doing the entire post-production myself. I felt accomplished. I was proud of my ability as someone now considered disabled. I knew I had more to offer, and apparently Nike did as well. I was very blessed to have been offered a job at their headquarters in Beaverton that fall with no real job roles or responsibilities in place. They just wanted me to come there and help them figure out how to create content in challenging atmospheres. I jumped at the opportunity. It's been an interesting journey learning to navigate life as a quadriplegic at a huge corporation at, at, like Nike. I went in there before I knew most of the realities of living in a wheelchair. When I look at what was going on with camera technology around that time, the industry was again going through a seismic shift, a shift to point of view. GoPro had given the athlete the ability to give their audience a first-hand account of their experience. Sure, it was just another element in the whole mix of filmmaking for us, but this was a puzzle that Nike needed me to solve. How to create content in the most challenging of, of environments with athletes that were now marketing themselves daily through publishing whatever photos or video clips they could get through their social networks. How could I harness this energy and turn it into a 365 marketing mix? The next few years, I'd produce an all-woman surf film, yearly skate films, and the favorite project I've ever worked on, a two-part snowboard film called Never Not. Getting, produced to, getting to produce films and advertising like this is still a complete privilege for me, and I'll never forget how I ended up here. What I really enjoy about working at Nike is it's been an amazing platform for me to expand my horizons. Not only working on amazing commercial creative, but also getting to sit on the Ability Network board and leading conversation around diversity and inclusion at one of the biggest corporations in America. Getting an education and product innovation from designers following the ethos, if you have a body, you're an athlete. It's truly been a privilege thus far. And I hope none of you forget the common theme that got me here today. That again, each and every one of us has the responsibility to use our privilege to create opportunities for others. I encourage you to be a mentor, to be a coach, to be a collaborator. And I think you'll be amazed at the opportunities you'll create. And I'm happy to answer any questions you guys might have that I might have left out of this. So. Thank you. Appreciate it. So yeah, I know I kind of uh, have the tendency to glaze over some things. So if any of you have any follow-up questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer a few for you. If not, happy to get off the stage. <laughs> <laughs> nice job, Riley. Thank you so much. Appreciate you being well, thank here. Thank you, guys.
We're going to take a quick 10 minute break. Does that work? Yeah, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I didn't see any hands. Sorry, go ahead. Good question. Um, I think that at first I was pretty bullheaded about it. I didn't want it to really change much about me. Um, showing up at Nike, I didn't want this chair to be part of my story. Um, I wanted to show up as an equal colleague with the rest of the brilliant folks that work up there. And I've, uh, over the years, realized that this is a huge part of my story. And this is really my platform to connect with people and to um, work on initiatives that are outside of the box for things that I'm, you know, would normally run into. I've gotten to work on, you know, Paralympic athlete innovation um, for special projects. Um, we've been working on, you know, special footwear, ease, ease of access footwear at Nike and and getting to work on some much bigger marketing initiatives of kind of turning around the lens of how we look at consumers at Nike and, and starting to design in, in a different way. Um, so I don't, I don't know if that answers your question, but. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Yeah, I feel like it's something that's kind of taboo that people don't really want to speak to necessarily um, in the professional world. But I think that with my ability to kind of own my story more and be more vulnerable around the, the topic, it's allowed for some bigger conversations and people to feel more comfortable approaching me about it. Um, for example, I'm, we're building a bunch of new campuses, or buildings up on campus, and the Workplace Design and Connectivity Group has reached out to me to help them understand what accessible design is. And that's something that I just never could have imagined crossing my path in my professional career. So I think it's a, it's a great platform for me um, if I'm able to embrace it. And honestly, it took me a while to get there, you know, to understand that this was actually going to be an asset for me and not a hindrance. Do any of you guys know people in chairs? Yeah. Yeah. I was going to ask you, like, if you had any advice for yourself, looking back, if you could, if you could spend a few minutes with yourself right after you had that transition, what advice would you give? And I say that in full, I mean, full disclosure, I want to I wanna give that advice to myself too. Yeah, I mean, the advice that I got about not focusing on the 900 things that you can't do and focus on the 100 that you can, that was huge for me when I was first rehabbing because I could barely lift my hand off the bed, you know? So I just had to focus on doing that until I could reach my face, you know? And it was a very slow progression. So I think that, you know, you can easily spin out and go down the wrong road mentally if you're looking at what you lost. And I think that that's, you know, been inevitably something that I've had to deal with over the last couple of years is more facing the realities that, well, shit, I'm not out mountain biking and skiing. And where, where is that um, release for me? You know, I love being focused on my career, but people take vacations and they take sweet vacations at Nike. And so I'm kind of <laughs> seeing that happen. <laughs> It kind of makes me want to go heli skiing again or something. So, how is your release? Where does your release I am a gardener. Yes. Yeah, Andrea has set up our whole backyard so that I have full access to roll under beds. And um, yeah, that's my thing. I, I garden now. Um, yeah, I, r I ride a bike. And uh, yeah, kind of live in. Portland city limits, so I'm a bit of an urbanite, but don't get on the hill very much, but I would like to in the future. Yeah? So, um, as you said, people aren't quite sure sometimes what to do, you know, when they see you or how to act, and, and also as a parent raising a child that you want to be compassionate and tolerant and understanding, but also treat people like everybody else, what advice would you give to people like, on how to interact with people? 
I think just be true to the, your curiosity. You know, it's the, we're, we're you can look at someone in a wheelchair in a vulnerable position, but also um, they want to be approached. You know, they want to be treated as normal. So if you have a question for them that you might feel like is private, I don't think you're going to get that pushback. I think people are pretty open to sharing if you show interest. So. All right. In the back. Sorry. I'll come back. I don't know. Thanks. You're so sweet. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Appreciate that very much. You're sweet. Yeah, we can do one more. Yeah, I mean, I think this last year has really been a, a turning point for me to kind of find my bandwidth outside of my career and, and, and make those efforts. Um, we initially, Andrea and I, wanted to get involved with Big Brothers Big Sisters. We went to a, a meeting, and of course, um, there's a Nike person on the board of Big Brothers Big Sisters that had me called into a meeting that next week, and, and we're going to pilot a program um, up at Nike called Beyond School Walls, where we bring kids from the Beaverton School District into Nike to have lunch with the employees and um, build some mentorships um, and do that bi-weekly and then have the employees uh, outside of the campus with them on the other weeks. So things like that, um, I, I get a lot of, I don't know, that just feels right for me. Um, I just had such great mentors growing up that being able to provide that to, to kids, I think, is, is hugely important and, and what I'm passionate about. What do you say? Oh, yeah, I, I just also, uh, I'm a board member on a, on a local Portland nonprofit called Harper's Playground, which is uh, based around building accessible playgrounds for kids. Um, it's a really cool project. So. Yeah. That, you guys, is yeah. In that? Yeah. We we've we're building three more in Portland right now. There's only one existing, but Nike donated the the recycled turf for it. So yeah. Yeah. It's very cool. Thanks a lot, you guys. Awesome. Thanks, Abby. Appreciate it.